figured it would be uh, a good time to go through my plays in October and kind of update people on some of my thoughts on things that I played. Uh, October proved to be pretty prolific because a lot of the new Essen releases came out and were presented at a local store for, for me called Blue Highway Games. So I went down there and played a bunch of those. I also picked up a lot of games this month, which I have not yet played. So my not played pile is getting a little out of hand, but that's okay. Um, I figured I'll start with uh, Five Cucumbers, which I have a copy of now. Uh, Five Cucumbers is a small, almost trick-taking game from Freedom and Freeze. It was put out by Czech Games. And um, you, you toss cards in the middle trying to take tricks, but you don't want to take the final trick, the final card. And you do want to stick the person with the final card with the most points possible. It's a interesting cool little game and you're trying to avoid taking points which is always fun and there's only a loser and a winners which I always appreciate because it's not that super common in gaming. Um, next I played a lot of Mask Men which is an oink game um, which in a trick-taking game you play hand over hand trying to prove who the strongest wrestlers are and so if I play a blue to debut the blue wrestler but you play two pink you're proving that pink is better than blue so um, going into that game you are playing cards to try and run out of cards the quickest um, it's really hard to manage your hand and you have these really beautiful lovely giant wrestler cards um, that was a really a fun game and I, I picked it up because I love it so much um, pick a letter was something we played at a trade show in Atlanta. Uh, you dump a big old uh, bucket of letters and pickles onto the table and you say one, two, three, go, and you're trying to match letters as fast as you can. And it's sort of like set where when you don't think any more matching letters are out, you give it a call, you, you call pickle, I think, and then, oh wow, there's nothing on here about this. Um, and as soon as that's done, then, um, at the end of the game, if you got... Uh, pairs, they're one point each. If you get all four of a given letter, they are um, two points each. So it's a pretty fun little game. And I, I would imagine once that comes out onto the market, there will be more information here because it was a pretty fun, silly little game. Um, next, we had a game of archaeology, which I've talked about before. I got to play the game Blood of an Englishman from Dan Kassar. Uh, he is the same designer as Arborino. If you guys ever played that, it's like kind of the tree arboretum building game. Blood of an Englishman is a really interesting two-player game. And so one of you is the jack and the beanstalk, and one of you is the giant at the top of the beanstalk. And so Jack has these tiny, nimble little actions, and the giant has big, slower actions, but they have more impact. And as a giant, you're trying to fee fi fo fum and get rid of Jack. And as Jack, you're trying to steal each of the treasures. And um, it was a really interesting one. Um... Again, just not super a lot of information online, but it is a really cool little game with its beautiful artwork, um, a very thematic uh, name for a game that's so abstract. But they, I, I feel like maybe that, that name is promising a little bit more than what it is. Uh, Capital Lux was fabulous. Uh, I've played it a couple times now. Uh, it is kind of a Tron-looking art, so you have these big futuristic crazy things. But the game itself is a little bit more mathy. Um, you see players uh, putting out cards trying to play either into their own tableau or into the middle in the city. You want to play as many cards as you can into your own tableau, but the value, the whole value of your stack can never be bigger than the city's stack or else you're going to lose all those points. And as soon as you play into any given city stack, you're going to get some abilities. So uh, nice, mathy little game coming out to the States any moment now. It's um, being ordered uh, as well as... A Porta Games also has uh, Avenue, which is one of their little roll and write games. And um, my friend Suze really, really loves Avenue, so I'm really excited for that to come out. I think it's going to do well. Uh, Checkpoint Charlie. I played a friend's copy of this, and it is a uh, really weird little memory game. So everybody has a piece of the information about the, the bad cat in the neighborhood, so the cat burglar. And so I might know that he's wearing a sweater, but the person next to me knows whether or not he's wearing a hat, and this person knows whether or not he's wearing glasses. And so everyone has that one piece of information. Then you take a card from the middle of the deck, and you flip it over, and if it matches the suspicious thing that you have, you keep it, and if it doesn't, you put it into the middle. 
and people have to remember what cats you are taking and which ones you're giving away. And um, as soon as you think you can identify the suspicious cat with all five pieces of evidence, you put a token on it. And you only get points if you get either four or five pieces of information correct. So it's a pretty interesting, crazy little memory game. It was a really weird one. Um, I only played one game of The Colonist, so I'll only go over this briefly because since my vlog about my initial play, which was only somewhat favorable, I found that we were playing two rules very, very wrong. So in the game, each player has kind of their own player board that they're going to build uh, farms and warehouses onto, and then there's a middle board, which is where your kind of worker walks around, and each time you take a step, you take the action associated with the tile. So you're going from market to market with all these little guys in the middle. We were playing a couple of scoring rules wrong, a couple of the way that you move inventory around incorrectly, and the way that you and the, the way that you score uh, your workers incorrectly. So my friend Ross would like to play a four-player full four-era game, which is a much longer game than what the two-era game that I did play. So I'll be interested to see what my updates might be, but I only played one game of that. I played the Dragon and the Flagon, which is a little, like, uh, prediction kind of uh, pre-programming game from Stronghold. Uh, I played Einstein, His Amazing Life, and Incomparable Science, which is an abstract game. It's kind of like competitive tangrams. Uh, I think that's Artana Games or Altana Games. I am going to mess that up. Oh, no. Uh, but in that one, you are trying to complete recipes or formulas or whatever you want to call them by adding things to the board. But as you add them, if you use other people's pieces in completing your tangram shape, you're going to give them points for each piece of theirs that you used. And there are common goals of trying to get like five triangles to touch or whatever. There's lots of little goals and stuff. Um, Eternity was a really fun, very classic style trick-taking game where you play tricks. If I lead a card, you have to follow. If you have a trump, you can trump something and then you're winning but the trump suit is kind of player determined and it's a pretty interesting scoring system uh played fight for olympus which is just a fabulous little two-player uh flitting bad wolf was a little deduction game um it's brand new it's just um something they were giving away at the booth in essen um from chin fan chi fan chin uh from homo sapiens lab uh so it's sort of like Love Letter, but with different player powers, right? So everyone's got a couple cards in their hand, and you are scoring cards as you go, trying to figure out where the Big Bad Wolf is and, and Little Red Riding Hood. And anytime you pull one of the two wolf cards into your hand, you have to howl. And that's supposed to help the other player understand um, what you might be playing with. So that's a pretty interesting little twist on it. It was pretty fun. I mean... I, for a free game, it was just fine. I've got it around the house here somewhere. The Flow of History. So I talked about this a little bit too, so I'll go over it quickly. I played my second game of it, and it went about as well as my first game. It's just a super combat-heavy kind of meme game. It is innovation, but attacking only. And I, I would say that maybe it's not going to be my favorite game. I really, really love what Jesse Lee did with Ponzi Scheme, so I, I don't know why I haven't been able to find the fun in this one, but the economy is neat. It's kind of a closed economy and you can edit it really easily. And there's some cool wonders and cool powers in here, but it is so attack heavy that I think it gets not fun for some players. It's it's fun to attack someone, but it's not fun to have to attack someone to, to take the best tile or card or whatever. Uh, Fuji Flush, really simple, fun card shedding game from Stronghold Games. It, just an easy $10 to spend, no, no brainer, just do it. Grand Austria Hotel, as always, so, so fabulous. Um, I got to play my first game of Great Western Trail. I now own the game and am looking forward to getting deeper and deeper into it. I did talk about it in a previous vlog, so I'll only go over really quickly that since playing it, I have heard from more and more people that it is not always necessary to buy cows, which I'm a little disappointed with because I love buying cows in the game, but I like that there are different strategies. I am hearing, though, that you want to study how Kansas City works and that it doesn't move trains. It's just a matter of being able to build where your train is or back. Um, that was something, I guess, was confusing newer players to the game. 
Um, Illumat I got to play, which is fabulous, and my store has a copy of it. Um, it's based off of a 52-card game called a Casino that I used to play with my dad all the time. And this is from Keith Baker. It was brought on from the Decemberists, who apparently are big board game nerds, and they asked Keith Baker to make them you know, a game out of a board game that they had designed for a music video. So he built this little board game that's sort of like Casino, with luminaries and with a little rotating board that restricts your actions in different sectors. It's just really great, simple, and has kind of a, a nice feature that um, in every game you're going to bring a token to the table called an Ocus, and your Ocus should be something cool and unique and personal to you, and I thought that was a really nice way of putting it. There's going to be tokens in the game, but he wanted everyone to use their Ocus. Uh, mine is going to be a 3D printed acrylic token that a friend gave me because he was goofing around with his new printer trying to get his boss to see how beautiful white printing can be versus um, printing over clear acrylic. And so it's just a, a picture of the, of the drawing he did for me. Uh, I played some Kanban with a friend who had a baby a couple years ago and hadn't been playing a lot of games. And the first game he wanted when he came back from his child being two and a little bit easier to to have just, just one parent or the other, he wanted to play Kanban with me because I'd been talking about it for two years. So I taught him his first game of Kanban with two other friends of mine, and it was a fabulous time. I had a great time. Karmica came in. It was a Kickstarter I backed, and... Um, it is a nice game. We played it two-player, which the rules seem to suggest that it was best at two. I think that the game is actually going to be better with multiple people because the game is so take-that heavy. It is, uh, You play a card, and you can play it for its value to help you level up and, and, and evolve yourself, or you can play it for its printed power if you play it for your printed power, the other player gets to decide whether or not they take that card. So if you're playing a mean power, that power might come back to bite you later, which I think is why it's intended for two, because they wanted it to be like, well, you did it, so you should expect that power back at you. But I think in a three or four player, you have a chance of directing those powers the way that they, they want to be directed, which is a little more interesting. So Karmica, I still have it. I just, I don't know if it's going to be viable at three or four. I'm, I'm looking forward to trying it. Um, the Le Grand Hall of the Dice game, No Siesta, was a fabulous little uh, roll and write game. So um, in the game, you roll the dice, kind of like in Le Grand Hall or Grand Austria Hotel, and um, the dice have all of the different uh, components you saw in the big game in Le Grand Hall. So you have one that is both olive and green, you have one that's grapes, you have a donkey, you have a hat. So you roll the dice and you take a die out of the middle and you get that thing. So maybe it's a grape or whatever. And then the next person rolls the dice and they take one and you go around until there's one die left that the starting player rolls and everyone gets one instance of that. And then if you can see you get this little paper sheet and you're going to either um, complete this one down here that gives you these deliveries, you're going to complete this one up here that gives you crates, you're going to complete these ones down here that give you kind of first come first serve victory points all really interesting and fun um it was a it was a great example of what you can do by taking a dice or a card version of something making it interesting and different enough from the base game to make it worthwhile um highly recommend a siesta i think it's really good uh lorenzo il magnifico this is um, one of the better games I've played that's come out of Essen lately, um, everyone is trying to collect cards and powers. So you've got four different types of cards, and each round, 16 of them come out. And it's just a really great game. Uh, it is a little bit AP prone because people are going to want to read all the cards that come out. But I love this element where if you'd like a blue card, you set down your piece and you pay for it. And if someone else that round wants a blue card, they have to pay extra money. So your money economy gets a little bit tricky. You have to make sure you've always got a, like an extra three money in your pocket to do that type of stuff with. Uh, Mi Tierra Nue Nueva Era. We've played just one game of it so far. Um, it's a worker placement game where you're trying to build up your farms. Um, it was interesting. This is the second version, which apparently is a little more complicated than the first version. But um, I did feel it was just a smidge on the long side. It didn't 
quite know what it was doing. It wanted you to build an engine, but it wasn't long enough to really give you a satisfactory payout. Um, I wasn't uber impressed with it, but I would definitely play it again, especially with someone else who might like it already, because that might show me something I was missing. Uh, I played a little Mystic Veil vale with the expansion, which was nice. Played some No Thanks. I got to play my first game of Oracle of Delphi. Um, so Oracle of Delphi is the uh, first person to get to 12 objectives wins. And you put out all these tiles, and you're running around the tiles trying to deliver things for the most part. And defeat monsters and find your little temples. Um, there were two things that frustrated me in the game so far. But overall, I really like it. First thing that frustrated me was um, kind of an ambiguous rule, which just uh, better wording would have cleared up no problem. Um, so in the game, when you're setting it up, you put out like as many red monsters as there are players, and you put out as many red cubes as there are players. Your goals are going to be a specific color of monster, another specific color of monster, and then a neutral color of monster. And the way the rules are written makes it sound as if I could take a red monster for my red specific goal and a red monster for my neutral goal and if I've only put out four on the board and there are four players that would make it where a player couldn't complete that goal but the way that the the actual rule works is that your neutral is one of another color so you have to get a red you have to get a blue and then you have to get one other color so the neutrals can never ever be the color of the tasks that are specific and they really, really needed to point this out because there are several types of goals that are color, co color specific, color specific, neutral. There are three of them. So um, the part I didn't quite enjoy was um, there are tiles all over the board that you have to flip up to find yours. You, you kind of peek at them. And then when you find yours, you can put a temple on it. Um, but it's really frustrating because you're kind of giving other people information when you don't put a temple on yours or you don't go near yours. Um, I didn't love that part of it, but that's totally something I can overlook. And the last part is that the first player each round rolls a die because you're going to get a bad card. And if they roll a six on that die, you're going to get two bad cards. And two bad cards in this game can be completely devastating. If you start your round with six of the bad cards or if you start with three of the same color of bad card, um, you lose your entire turn. So you, there's a little bit of mitigation of making sure you're taking care of those cards, but if Steffenfeld wants me to have two bad cards sometimes, he should have just written that in. This rolling the die nonsense is really annoying. In my game of it, that never ever happened, but in the reported game that happened right before mine did, twice it happened where people were getting two of those cards and losing their turns. And it's not, it's it's just not a fun kind of randomness for me. So I will say if I get to my third or fourth game of it, I might just stop rolling the die and just give everyone a card every turn. I played one game of Speechless on camera. If you go look at the game on our YouTube, um, you can see my guesses. I didn't actually get up and act in front of the camera because I'm a big old party pooper. Because I don't, I don't care to do a lot of charades. It's just not my thing. Um, I played some Hashtag Me, which was called Story Tags originally, which is a party game. Which is actually pretty fun. Someone's telling a story, like a story from their life. And you throw hashtags down as applicable. And it's it's a pretty fun one, especially if you like to speak internet speak like I do. Played a little Terraforming Mars last month. Just one game of it. Uh, still a fabulous game. Still still looking for something I don't like in the game. And I haven't found it yet. Uh, it looks like Game Trays out of St. Louis has also printed up some of the player board trays. So I'm going to be buying those. And they're relatively inexpensive. So please go take a look if you haven't already. Played a little troll on on the Essen Night, which is kind of a weird little grid game. Not great at three players. It was much better in multiplayer. Played Twins, which is an oink game, but it was designed by Rainier Knizia. Um, really weird little hand management game. I quite enjoyed it. I would have liked it at more players, but it was interesting. And graphically, the fronts of the cards are absolutely gorgeous and the back are hideous, so I'm not sure why. Um, and last but not least, I played a game of Ulm. Ulm is an r, &R title. It is one of their two kind of heavier titles this season. So um, they did a game called Toria, which has got like a little 
Oh, it's hard to describe. There's little towers in the corners, and as you play, you can rotate the towers, and whatever colors are facing you are the people that you can go and see, and you got to see all these people. And it's a pretty interesting one. Ulm itself is a city, and um, it is... You are trying to progress through these little uh, disc spaces down at the bottom and place your discs up here at the top. So you've got these little boats in the middle and wherever you are on this river is where you can place above or below. And there's this neat little grid pushing mechanism. So there's a grid of nine and if I put a tile in over here, I push everything down one. So then I take the action of the three uh, that are left in the row or column that I've affected. And there's a little bit more to it than that, but for an R&R &R title, it's a little bit more involved. And it was pretty darn fun. I, I had a good time. It's got this weird, like, 3D cathedral, which didn't have any utility in the game, and unfortunately, if you're sitting at the bottom of the board, it meant, it meant you couldn't really see the little formula at the top, but, I mean, that's just nitpicking, honestly. It was a perfectly great game, and I had a lot of fun playing it. I'm glad I got to. Um, so that was my month in games. I hope you all are having some fun yourselves. I just com completed Extra Life. Um, our team ended up at 13.5, not including the upcoming auction for Stephanie Straw. So we have exceeded our goal times a million. I got hit in the face with Pi. I played a lot of light games over 25 hours and I'm a little exhausted now. But uh, Extra Life is always a good time. I will be going to BGG. So I have a feeling that November will have a lot of, of plays for me. Um, most looking forward to getting another Great Western Trail under my belt. Um, that would be my first priority. And then hopefully I want to learn Role Player, which is the worker placement dice game where you roll a D&D &D character. So that's what I'm looking forward to most. I hope y'all are well, and I'll see you next time. Bye!